Today's scripture lesson is taken from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, who I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What was the most glorious experience of your life? Think about it for a moment. Was it an engagement? Marriage? The birth of a child? Accomplishing something you never thought possible? Encountering an epiphany that changed the course of your life? What was the most glorious experience of your life. Would anyone care to share? Anyone in this aisle? Yeah? What was the most glorious experience of your life? I'm going to school and learn how to become an artist. Okay. Anybody in this aisle? Okay. What do you think I'm going to say? Mom. Okay. The birth of my son. Okay. Okay. I saw a hand. Uh, my wife and my family. What, what a smart thing to say with your wife sitting right here. <laughs> my wife has passed. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Anybody back here? Everybody's doing their best to look away. I'll come around. Anybody over here? Yes, ma'am. Having my children and living long enough to see my great-grandchildren and my great-great-grandchildren. I'm working hard not to make any old jokes right now. <laughs> that, but that's a wonderful thing. That is a wonderful thing. I haven't forgot you over here. Anybody over here have anything they want to share? The most glorious experience of your life. Anybody? Here we come. I see a nodding head. Having my three kids. Okay. Any more special than the other? My first probably because he was my first. Because they're the first. I understand that. You know that in family albums. There's 500 pictures of the first child. There's 200 pictures of the second child. You got to look hard to find any pictures of the third on. <laughs> Pardon? Are you number three? No, I was number two. <laughs> <laughs> there were no middle childs in my home, at least none that I know of. <laughs> Anybody in this aisle? My kids, my kids, my grandkids, great grandkids. Okay. Anybody in this aisle? When I got married. There you go. The most glorious moment in her life was when she got married. I bet you were a pretty bride. <laughs> Anybody here? Any takers? Jack has had no glorious moments. That's sad. <laughs> Anybody here? Okay. You just nod at me. I'll come to you. It's awfully quiet. No, I'm not joking. I'm being serious. I want to know. What was the most glorious moment in your life? You were nodding before. Me? Yes. Um, being able to see Queen Mary beached on the uh, beaches of San Diego. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, hello there. Good morning. Anybody else want to share? You were going to say something. Yes. Uh, knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. For All right. Time. Amen. Yes, sir. Then I gave myself to God last seven years. Okay. And I'm very happy. Great testimony. Last chance. Second chance at life. 
there you go. And to take it. I heard it, am I to come back somewhere? I'm sorry. Boy, when they're whistling for the pastor, you better get a moving. <laughs> Now, you can't all point at each other. Which one wanted me? Well, I've had several. I think mostly the ones when we met our foreign exchange students in their home countries. OK. That would be fun. Very much so. OK. So we kind of see a general, some general themes. New life, new relationships new points of view. And in each of those, the word new seems to appear. So we travel on, remembering that T.S. Eliot said, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far they can go. So now that you have said, these are the glorious experiences of my life, what did we do with that experience? Or consider it another way. What did that experience do to us? Manny, what did that experience do to you? Uh, it made me an, uh, a nice person and, and trying to uh, do my uh, artwork in a nice way for people who can have a smile on their face. Very good, because I'll tell you that the art school was right above the school of music where I went to school. Yes. They, that school didn't teach them to be happier, nicer people. It taught them to be mean perfectionists. <laughs> what did your glorious experience teach or do for you? Well, it gave me grandchildren. So that <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think probably it taught me to um, put someone before myself, to always look, you know, do things for him. Before. A drastic change in perspective. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Over here. Pretty much the same. Not to be a selfish person anymore. When you're responsible for someone else, you begin to see things completely different, don't you? I remember the first time I put my child in a car seat to drive it somewhere. I thought, you've driven all the time. Why are you nervous? Because you're now fully responsible for someone else who can't jump out when they see me doing something stupid. <laughs> Compromising in daily living. Okay. Yeah. You can't always have it your way. All those who are married, remember, you can't always have it your way. I best stop right there. Moving along. <laughs> Why are you laughing so hard? I'd still get my way. <laughs> I'm leaving that alone. But I will tell you, I've had many would-be grooms come to my office for marriage counseling, and they tell me how their life is going to be once they get married. And I say to them, let me say this one sentence to you. Memorize it. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Simple as that. All right, who else shared something? You shared something. What has it done to you? Made me tired. <laughs> <laughs> so that glorious experience that it meant so much to you, the change it has made in you is it has made you tired. But I love them all. Okay. All 13 of them. As grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Well, what you needed to do was get the older ones to babysit the younger ones. <laughs> Anybody down here? What did that experience now do to you? Well, as of last month, it may be a great, great grandfather. There you go. Are you a good great, great grandfather? Are you a spoiling great, great grandfather? No, they're too far away. Ah, OK. All right. Did I pretty much, well, there is some back here. I'll zip right back here real quick, but I don't want to take up too much time. What did that experience, that glorious experience, in hindsight, what has it done to you or for you? The happy and the peace that I get. Very good. Yes, Troy? I learned to love and get along with others. Okay. <laughs> Very good. How huge this thing has 
been um, beached up on the shores of San Diego. Okay. How enormous it was. Okay. What has it been, or what has it done to you? It gave me the realization that people of other countries are really sweet and nice. They can be nice. The problem we're having with other countries are the politicians. Okay. But, but it does give you a different perspective that you otherwise never would have had. Life is about experiences. And you and I are called through the Word of God to experience life, to be a part of life, to embrace life. The experience of life offers us constant teaching in a way different than any classroom or any textbook. Books and rote lessons provide us the window of opportunity to seek further. Without the foundational basic skills, we will never be able to refine talent potentials that can become masterpieces. Rote lessons provided for us give us a foundation to build on. If I was deciding to learn the piano, I can learn scales, I can learn arpeggios, I can learn intervals and basic sight reading talents. But even with all of this, we never will be able to compose that masterpiece without some form of inspiration. So the next question now before us is, from where do we derive our inspiration? Because our Bible talks a lot about inspiration. In most cases, New and Old Testament alike, those times of inspiration come in the midst of nature and biblically many times on a mountain. Neiman Bull said, mountains have a way of dealing with our overconfidence. When we are inspired to do something, it is many times not because of who we are or what we have done or what we know. Rather, it is most times a decision that is made in spite of some of those truths. Sir Edmund Hillary said, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. In life, we many times find there are two types of inspiration, both of which can be gifts to us. The first is the common inspiration, those thoughts and ideas that are lent to us by circumstance, by casual conversations, and by presentation, either through books, media, or other everyday occurrences that lend themselves to our conscious or our subconscious streams of thought that result in us realizing, I have a thought, an idea, a glimmer, a potential of something that I would like to realize. Dr. Seuss says, today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. The second form of inspiration is that given by God through the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. There are plenty of those moments to be found in our Bibles. Now some of you might say, yeah, Brian, those are things that happened back in biblical times. How about something more, in, more current human history? The most popular oratorio ever written is The Messiah by George Frederick Handel. Most oratorios, requiems, and symphonies and the likes take months, if not years, to complete. The initial idea or theme may come in a moment, but composing, developing each and every instrument and vocal part is a major time-consuming undertaking. Keeping that in mind, consider this. The entire score of the Messiah, from front to finish, was composed and scored in 23 days. He attributed it to being a spiritual gift from God. 
Now, some of you might say, Brian, I really don't relate to George Frederick Handel. I rarely attend oratorios. Don't you have anything a little more in my ballpark? And I would say to you, Paul McCartney said the entire tune and lyric to his song, Let It Be, came to him much like a spiritual gift. And if you've ever been to any of his concerts where he sings it, it is a time where they black out the entire stadium and people hold up candles just like they're going to church when that song is presented. Most composers will tell you the best songs are many times simply spiritual gifts. This idea of spiritual inspiration is not limited to musical composers. It's just composers are more up my personal alley. But we all have different alleys in different backgrounds that can be built upon. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, what spiritual experiences have I encountered that have changed my life? Casey Nesta said, the most dangerous thing you can do in life is to play it safe. Some of us spend an inordinate amount of time avoiding spiritual truths. Over the years, I've had numerous people come to me and share with me their dreams, their ideas, their passing thoughts, and then they complete their presentation after they've told me all these things. Then they'll look at me and say, so, do you think I'm crazy? Should I pursue this? God never asked us to avoid spiritual realities. He asks us to logically embrace them. And if we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that almost everything about Jesus of Nazareth is a tad off-center of our human understanding and expectations. Every teaching, every miracle, every simple act is a bit of a revelation that stands our knowledge on its head and then opens an entirely new way of viewing the situation. Good United Methodists like logic and simple explanations. Good Roman Catholics, however, like to leave the door open a crack to attributing or misunderstandings to the mysteries of God. We like to measure the mountains of life from the bottom and then decide if we're going to be able to climb it. Dag Hammarskjöld said, never measure the height of a mountain until you reach the top. Then you will see how low it was. Consider all the interactions that you can recall between Jesus and his disciples, nearly each and every one of them if you or I would singularly experience it firsthand, might call that moment a mountaintop experience. After all, how many people have we seen somebody else raise from the dead? How many times were any of our associates able to prove themselves wiser than any of the authorities that stood in our midst? These alone are not to mention his ability to give them the ability to teach, to heal, or to successfully proclaim and to have others respond. And as we consider this, keep in mind, we are charged to be just like them. Nietzsche said, he who climbs upon the highest mountains laugh at the tragedies, real or imagined. In so many instances in the life of humanity, Jesus invites us to the mountain. He has invited us to journey. A majority decline the offer. Some will travel as long as there is comfort in the process. In being faithful to the climb, some will transcend to the top, and they will see and experience what others can only contemplate. Martin Luther King Jr. said, For I have been to the mountaintop. He has allowed me to go to the mountain, and I have looked over, and I have seen the promised land. In our passage this morning, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the mountaintop, 
And in this moment, they experience a truth far beyond a human capacity to understand. And in some cases, for those who like to deny, far beyond human comprehension. And he presents them with the unpresentable. And they are there for a purpose. They are there to experience. They are there to embrace. They are there to encounter something so magnificent that they will never ever throughout the remainder of their life be able to deny, reframe, or for to get this event. While all the apostles carry their God-given missions, which of the twelve do we hear of the most? Peter, James, and John. They are, if you will, pregnant with the fullness of the ideas, the ideals, and the magnificence that is literally and physically before them. And also the exact same which is yet to be before them in this life and in the life yet to come. And then consider their response. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Poor Peter. Even in the midst of the transformational, unbelievable revelation provided, he wants to establish something worldly and physical. And we tend to do that with a lot of God's revelations. We try to make them worldly. This was never God's intent. It was always ours. René Dumas said, you cannot stay on the summit forever. You have to come down. So why bother in the first place? Just this. What is above knows what is below. But what is below does not know what is above. One climbs. One sees. One descends. One sees no longer. But one has seen. And will always remember. If we are smart we embrace the wisdom of Rene. Unfortunately, our passage from Mark this morning tells us another story beginning in verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising of the dead must mean. They forgot all about what they had just seen and witnessed. No, let's focus on this one sentence of Jesus. And sometimes we are unable to see the beauty of the forest, but for one single tree. Thankfully, in hindsight, they put into writing so that we might know. But knowledge itself is many times void of the experience. Each of us have mountains to climb, inspirations to embrace, compositions to complete. As this new year begins to unfold before us, let us be open to the transformational possibilities that continually remain before us, around us, and like Peter, James, and John in their writings, behind us. Let us seek that which God would offer in the knowledge that such experiences are not merely for ourselves. All that God gives is for the enrichment of all that God has made possible, both seen and unseen. A song from the 70s proclaimed the biblical truth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Let us pray. 
Our Lord, some of us are quite content with where we are and we have no intent of climbing any spiritual mountains. Some of us have climbed mountains in our past and we retain the remembrance of them not only to solidify our faith and hope in you but also to retain our understanding of that which is yet to be. And some of us, Lord, are still in the process of climbing. Enable us to understand that by your love, by your grace, by your mercy, the journey will be worthwhile in ways beyond our ability to ever make them known. Lord, enable us not to fear that which you wish to give. Enable us to embrace your spirit in ways that we have drawn away from. Enable us to fully open ourselves to that which you would have us to have. To that which you would have us to be. To that which you would have us to know. And enable us in that time to fully understand your love, your presence, and your desire for us. For we ask these things in the name of Christ our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen.